Hi there. I'm Dr. Scott Hausworth, and I'm an optometrist at Minnesota Eye Consultants in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Tonight we're going to talk about Demodex. I've been in clinical practice at Minnesota Eye for approximately 14 years, and nearly a decade of that time has been spent building a, a niche within our practice, dealing with the treatment and management of ocular surface diseases, amongst which, which blepharitis, and specifically Demodex blepharitis, is a subcategory. So the presence of Demodex blepharitis presents an interesting challenge to us as clinicians, um, simply because of the impact that the lids and the, and the lid margin has on the, the tear film and the health of the ocular surface tissues. We've known for many years that blepharitis is a significant contributor uh, to various types of ocular surface inflammation. Uh, in, ex in examining patients in my own clinic, treatable infestations of Demodex occur in a fairly high percentage of patients. So with that in mind, how do we best diagnose the presence of Demodex? Actually, there are several clues that are present in patients who are likely um, carriers of high numbers of Demodex mites. And if we pay attention to these clues, we can then perform one or two simple examination techniques, <clears throat> which will confirm the presence of the critters and help us determine the best route of action. So let's go through those clues. The first one, and if you're going to only use one, I would have you look for the presence of cylindrical dandruff. It's probably the easiest clinical sign to recognize at the slit lamp, and it's quite possibly the best clue to watch for overall. Cylindrical dandruff is a little bit different than the scaly, scurf-like debris that commonly we associate with anterior blepharitis. This is a little more waxy material, which sheaths the, the lash starting at the follicle and extending up to about a millimeter or more in some patients. It tends to be very pronounced on the upper lids, this is where we see it the most, but if you look for it, it can be present on the lower lid um, lashes as well. And in patients with high infestations, we can actually see a little bit of cylindrical dandruff form on the fine hairs of the skin, of the eyelid, and the upper brow region as well. Okay, number two, look for alterations of the skin surrounding the lash follicle. In healthy patients, we have normally a very flat surface with very little lid margin telangiectasia or redness. In patients that are infested with Demodex, oftentimes the skin will actually pout up towards the lash and <clears throat> it can be a little bit red as well. And oftentimes if we look at the skin around um, the lash follicle, we'll find a waxy or oily uh, debris. And this is commonly seen um, in patients uh, who are younger a little bit as well. Number three, with all of the changes that are going on in the skin around the lid, it's maybe not a surprise that we'll see changes in the appearance of the lash as well. So the lashes may begin to thin, they become a little bit brittle, and they, begin, uh, they, can, they can become whitish in appearance as well. So <clears throat> watch for those changes. Occasionally you might even see uh, misdirection of the lashes or even lash loss in patients that have severe infestations or if the infestation has been going on for a long period of time. Lid hyperemia and lid margin telangiectasia are two signs uh, of inflammatory changes <clears throat> and because the presence of mites is associated with an increase in um, interleukins and different types of pro-inflammatory cytokines, it's not a surprise that we'll see uh, increasing amounts of lid margin vascularization as well. Lastly, don't forget to check your patient history. Um, there's a strong correlation uh, with Demodex in patients with uh, facial rosacea, acne rosacea, other types of inflammatory dermatitis, and there's even some link to basal cell carcinoma as well. There's also um, symptomatically a strong association with itching and <clears throat> other allergic symptoms and there's a strong correlation with meibomian gland dysfunction as well. So those are your clues. And now you know what to look for, then you can move on to actually confirming the diagnosis and the presence of Demodex mites, and you might even be able to get a chance to actually categorize patients on, on the level of infestation once you apply the following two techniques. Okay, first technique that you can choose is lash epilation. And this is just simply taking a lash with a forceps and pulling it out of the skin. Try to get as much of the cylindrical dandruff and any other associated debris as well, and then take that lash and debris and put it under a light microscope <clears throat> and look for a uh, number of mites. 
this is relatively um, easy to do as long as you have the right equipment. And fortunately, light microscopes nowadays aren't that expensive to get. Um, the only problem, the only downside with lash epilation is that there is a tendency to leave a few of the mites behind in the lash follicle, so you don't always get um, all of them to come out with it. <clears throat> Um, most studies that have looked at Demodex infestation over the past few decades have utilized this method, though, um, looking at two different lashes um, per eyelid and counting the total number of mites. Um, we do see also that there is some variance in between the number of mites and even adjacent follicles. So the, the lashes that you choose are important if you're utilizing this method. I tend to go for the lashes that are a little bit thinner, that look like they've, they've had more of an infestation, and ones that have a high amount of cylindrical dandruff. Second method is lash rotation, and this is a little bit of a newer technique, um, but it's, it's actually the one I employ in clinic most often. So here you actually grab a lash with a pair of forceps a little bit higher up, um, say a couple millimeters above the lash base, and you begin to gently pull it as well as rotate it around with the center being the opening of the lash follicle. By doing this, you're actually going to express out of the lash follicle a good amount of debris, oil, as well as mites. And in examining this under the microscope, um, <clears throat> under the slit lamp microscope, uh, you're able to get an idea of how many mites were in the follicle and the degree of infestation. The major drawback here is that it does take a little bit of time, not much fortunately, but a little bit of time to master the technique, and it can be a little bit more difficult in, in certain patients to get an accurate count if there's a lot of debris um, which might cover up the appearance of some of the mites. So now that you have an idea of what clues to look for and how to confirm your diagnosis through either epilation or lash rotation, there are a couple of challenges um, that I think I'd be remiss not to include um, once you begin this process. Number one, it does take a little bit more time uh, to perform examination. Okay? We're paying close attention to the lashes here uh, and perhaps employing um, you know, a, a light microscope to, to confirm our diagnosis. This takes a little bit more time out of your regular examination. More importantly, though, it takes a little bit of time to appropriately counsel patients about their condition, and this really depends on how open you are about their diagnosis and their condition um, and how detailed you are in explaining things to them. This, for many, many doctors, may be the biggest challenge in undertaking this disease. The other thing that I've noticed is that um, as, a, as a clinician who's been engaged in treating and diagnosing ocular surface disease, there's a strong dissociation in many patients with the degree of infestation and the amount of symptoms they present with. And so <clears throat> not unlike dry eye patients with um, severe forms of dry eye, uh, many patients may come in with severe infestations and yet be very, very comfortable minimally or even completely asymptomatic. So in these patients, it, it does take a little bit of a challenge to, to, you know, talk to them about their condition. But again, it's not unlike other forms of ocular surface disease. And I think perhaps the same mechanisms that drive um, patients to be comfortable despite the presence of severe pathology, things like inflammation and, and neurological adaptation and neurological damage, those are probably driving um, the same factors in demodex blepharitis patients as well. So in summary, as you're examining your next patient in clinic, keep a lookout for some of the clues that we can associate with demodex infestation. Be ready to confirm your presumed diagnosis by either lash epilation or lash rotation. And I think you'll be surprised at the sheer numbers of patients that you find with this condition um, who are harboring these little organisms and that the impact that they have on the ocular surface is significant. So happy hunting. <laughs>